Organic synthesis is like solving a puzzle. But here's the secret. Your mind already has all the pieces. You just have to snap them together. Every reaction is a clue. Every reagent is a move. Organic synthesis isn't just chemistry. It's a puzzle waiting to be solved. And the best part? You already have the pieces. Let's learn how to put them together. In this video, I'm going to show you the five tricks to solve any synthesis problem. Step one is learning all the chemical reactions. Step two is spotting all the functional group changes. Step three is making new carbon-carbon bonds. Step four is using retrosynthetic analysis. And make sure you stick around to the end so that you get trick number five, which is going to help you master any organic synthesis problem. Let's say you need to prepare a means. Each of these reactions you can consider a tool to keep in your toolbox. For example, do you remember that you can hydrogenate a nitro group on a benzene to make an aniline derivative? To make primary amines, we only know three different ways to do that. You can take sodium azide and then reduce it using H2 and platinum or lithium aluminum hydride to turn your alkyl azide into an alkyl amine. There's Gabriel synthesis, which uses phthalamid to make primary amines, and probably the most versatile way is to use reductive amination, where you take a carbonyl compound, use a catalytic amount of acid, introduce your amine, and then reduce using a reducing agent known as sodium cyanoborohydride. Before you solve synthesis problems, you have to actually know the reactions. There's no way around it. Organic chemistry is like a language, where the vocabulary is reactions. One strategy I always recommend is using flashcards to memorize all the different reactions you've learned about in organic chemistry. I actually have a set in the description that you can check out, or you can make your own. Let's try a simple two-step reaction. In this case, we have a cyclic compound that contains an alkene. And in the product, you're trying to make a different cyclic compound that this time contains a nitrogen as a part of that cyclic structure. One way to achieve this is to first perform ozonolysis on the alkene to break apart that ring. This will generate two aldehyde structures and allow us to do reductive amination to close that ring and also make our brand new cyclic amine. If you're watching this video, it's likely you've seen a Professor Dave Explains video as well. I just launched a podcast and Professor Dave is actually one of the first guests I've ever had. If you want to see our conversation, make sure to check out Unknown Variables podcast down below. Here's another reaction that follows a similar pathway. See if you can figure out the answer before I give it to you. Again here, we have a cyclic alkene. And in this case, we can break that open using the same conditions, which is O3 and DMS. This is what's known as ozonolysis. This will split the alkene, giving us two different aldehyde positions. And again, from here, we can use reductive amination to form our brand new cyclic amine structure that has also increased the number of atoms as a part of that ring. The next trick is to look for functional group transformations. In other words, converting things like alcohols into alkyl halides. That's a very common example. On the screen are various alkyl halides and the reagents used to transform them into something else. See if you can figure out what the product of each of these transformations will be. The first example is a classic example of a substitution reaction using sodium hydroxide to turn that alkyl bromide into an alcohol. Similarly, with sodium cyanide, this turns that alkyl halide into a cyano group. Importantly, this allows us to extend our carbon chain, one of the few ways we know to do that. But we can also transform this alkyl halide into an alkene. If you use a base, a big bulky one like DBU or DBN, or a really strong bulky base like potassium terputoxide, we can turn this alkyl halide into an alkene. Identifying those functional group changes is key to your success in organic synthesis. The next one, though, is going to be how to figure out how to extend carbon chains. You've only learned about a few types of carbon-carbon bond-forming reactions, so being able to use them when necessary is key to your success in synthesis. We've already seen how ozonolysis can break apart carbon-carbon bonds, but can you find the answer to these questions that result in carbon-carbon bond formation? In the first example, you have an alkyne being introduced to a really strong base called sodium amide. This will deprotonate the hydrogen at the terminal alkyne, generating a carbanion which can be used to do substitution reactions with alkyl halides. A great way to make cyclic structures is going to be the Diels-Alder reaction, where you take a 4-pi system and react it with a 2-pi electron system to do a cycloaddition reaction, the product of which is always some cyclohexene derivative. Friedel Crafts alkylation and acylation reactions are fantastic strategies to extend carbon chains when one of the reactants is a benzene derivative. And finally, the Wittig reaction is a useful strategy to make new carbon-carbon bonds, specifically when one of the reagents is a ketone or an aldehyde. So once you know all the reactions, 
Then you can help identify what is going to be a functional group transformation that needs to occur in your synthesis. Next, we can build larger and more complicated molecules by extending carbon chains with carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. The fourth trick for solving synthesis problems is retrosynthesis, or starting from the product and moving to the reactant. In other words, going in the reverse direction. Consider this reaction in particular. Notice that in our product, we contain a carbon chain that is several carbons longer than our starting material. This means we'll need to do a carbon-carbon bond forming reaction at some point. Additionally, we have a functional group transformation, where we're turning an alcohol into a carboxylic acid. We only know a few ways to generate carboxylic acids. One of them is going to be the introduction of a Grignard reagent to CO2 under acidic conditions, and that will allow us to do a carboxylation reaction. The other strategy that's common in organic chemistry is using sodium cyanide to extend the carbon chain and make a cyano functional group. By introducing a strong acid and heat, we can turn that cyano group into a carboxylic acid. And what's more is that both of these strategies rely on the previous reactant being an alkyl halide to do that substitution reaction. And I know that we can turn alcohols into alkyl halides, specifically an alkyl bromide, using phosphorus tribromide. And then from there, you just write out the reagents in the forward direction. Now the fifth step is really more advanced and comes with practice. And if you're getting value from this video, make sure that you subscribe to the channel down below. The fifth trick is pattern recognition. For example, anytime I see a product that contains an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound, it's likely that this proceeded via an aldol condensation. An aldol condensation is an organic reaction that forms a carbon-carbon bond between two carbonyl compounds, like aldehydes or ketones. This results in a beta-hydroxy carbonyl compound, which then often undergoes dehydration to form an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And being able to identify these patterns can be helpful in predicting what are the synthetic route that you need to take to form your product. Now let's see if you can put it all together with these practice problems. See if you can use the strategies of this video to solve these problems. Give it a shot yourself and then resume the video to check your answers. We definitely have some functional group transformations because we start with an alkene and we end with an ether. Additionally, we need to be able to extend our carbon chain. So notice that our alkene contains six carbons, which means we need to be able to add two additional carbons to the end of that chain. There's only a few reactions that will achieve extending carbon-carbon bonds, and a Grignard reagent is gonna be very useful for that. Using retrosynthesis, I know that I can make our final product ether by substituting an alcohol with an alkyl halide, which means the step before forming our final product must have been that substitution reaction. To generate that alcohol, I know a few different ways that I can do this. One of the most important is gonna be the reaction of a Grignard reagent to an epoxide. I have a whole video here that you can check out all the different epoxide reactions. And then finally, to make epoxides, we just need to take our alkene, introduce it to MCPBA, and that will give us our terminal epoxide. Putting it all together, our alkene becomes an epoxide for, through the introduction of that metachloroperoxybenzoic acid. Reacting this epoxide with a Grignard reagent will extend our carbon-carbon bond at the less substituted carbon position. This kicks up the oxygen to make our alcohol, which we need to do a substitution reaction. We can achieve this by first deprotonating the alcohol using sodium hydride, and then introducing ethyl bromide to give us our ether. In the next reaction, we're turning an alkyne into a diol. To achieve this synthesis, I see that I need to extend my carbon chain. And since I have an alkyne, the best way to do this is gonna be through alkyne alkylation. Again, I have a video about this that you can check out on the screen. The first step will be to deprotonate the terminal hydrogen to give us a carbanion, which will do a substitution reaction with ethyl bromide. Next, I can partially reduce this alkyne to an alkene using H2 and Lindlar's catalyst. This is specifically going to give me the Z alkene, and this will be important to make our product with this stereospecificity. Next up is another reaction using an epoxide, where first we generate the epoxide using metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, or MCPBA for short, and the next step will be to introduce an acid to get us to our diol. For the next reaction, this is very typical organic chemistry two reactions, where we're using electrophilic aromatic substitution to perform these transformations to generate our product. Starting from benzene, we can do a friedel crafts acylation using an acid chloride and the aluminum chloride Lewis acid. This gives us a brand new benzyl ketone, 
which we can then actually reduce down to just containing an ethyl group using zinc and mercury and hydrochloric acid. This is what's known as a Clemenson reduction. Now that we've generated this alkylbenzene derivative, we can do orthopara substitution because this is an orthopara directing group. I have a video that you can check out all about directing groups in organic chemistry. This will allow us to nitrate the para position by introducing this compound to nitric acid and fuming sulfuric acid. This is what's known as a meta director. So in addition to the ortho directing group of the alkyl chain, this means that we can chlorinate the position that is ortho to the alkyl group and meta to the nitro group. Introducing Cl2 and iron trichloride allows us to achieve this reaction. Next up is the oxidation of our benzyl alkyl chain using KMNO4. This is a common pathway to oxidize those alkyl chains into carboxylic acids. And then from here, probably the best way to achieve an ester synthesis is actually going to be an SN2 type reaction, as opposed to like Fischer esterification. This requires us to deprotonate the carboxylic acid and then introduce an alkyl halide to generate our brand new ester. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love for you to give it a thumbs up down below and subscribe to the channel so that you never miss out. I'll see you next time.